Welcome back. So you hopefully had the time to do the activity on a study of God by Augustine, very famous, important uh, work of, of um, religious kind of dogma. And um, hope, you know what I hope you got out of it um, was really how uh, Christians begin to believe that there's an afterlife, right? Particularly one that provides something to every person. Whereas before, it really focused maybe on the upper classes, on royalty, or you know, significant people. Here, we see Christianity give um, some hope um, once you're once you're gone, because eventually we will die, right? You can't you can't stop that from happening. And um, like I said at the last lecture, there is light at the end of the tunnel. However, you need to leave uh, live sorry a good life. Um, why you're here, right? The, the, the whole city's created, um, because it's, it's supposed to be a representation of this higher city up in, up in heaven. <clears throat> and, and so that piece addresses a few things, which I'm going to talk about, talk about right here. So understand that Christianity is something that's being built, right? As I said in the previous lecture, there are many kind of forms of Christianity early on. Uh, every region has its own kind of twist on it. But by the, you know, three, four hundreds, you be, really begin to see Christianity solidify into a, a homogenous faith, if you will. It has to do with a few people that shape it. Uh, there is this idea called Neoplatonism. Now, if you ever taken philosophy, you probably have heard of Plato. This idea that Things in the material world are not real. Only ideas that exist in the abstract are real. Things in the material world are kind of cheap imitations of those perfect concepts. So let's take, for example, a book. Well, we all know what a book looks like, right? And we probably have many books around us. But the perfect, the perfect example of a book exists out in some kind of abstract world, right? It's, it's more of an idea. And the books that we own are just kind of cheap replicas of that. Now that's something that you see in the city of God, not the book part, but this idea that there's something perfect in the abstract, but everything on earth is a cheap imitation of that, or you know, obviously not as perfect. Now, Plotinus kind of utilizes Plato's idea to make this connection with Christianity. <clears throat> and he argues that everything has a connection to a supreme deity, right? Um, he argues that the body um, has a soul, right? Everybody has a soul, and we all have flesh. Now, these are two separate things. Um, and ultimately, the body, or sorry, the soul needs to separate from the body. The body corrupts us. The body is dirty. The body has certain desires that might go against a pure, clean soul. So ultimately, the goal is to uh, to have the soul leave the body. This is an important element of Christianity because we still um, follow this idea to some extent, right? We believe you know we want to keep our soul clean, but our body has certain um, goals, whether it be food. Right, or whether it be water, or even sexuality. So Plotinus kind of argues this this kind of point that um, in order to be in spiritual union with God, we must let go of these kind of earthly bondages that we have, which essentially is the body. Right, the body maintain maintains us here, while the soul wants to be connected to God. So not that the goal is to die, but um, eventually if you do die and, and you leave, live kind of like a good moral life, you're going to be connected with God. Now we see this in many ways. Um, one example is Augustine, the city of God I just read, right? You have this perfect city which exists in the, in the heavens, right? And then you have an imperfect city that's going through chaos. Uh, which is Rome, which is what Augustine's kind of describing here. And the goal really is to create heaven on earth. So he doesn't say, oh, just go ahead and die because you can go to the great city right away. He says, look, you need to live a good life here 
and eventually that's going to pay off once you leave this earth and go into heaven. So this idea might sound more complex than it actually is because uh, in reality we still use it and we still have it. Um, it might not be religious, but it's still there. Right? So this just kind of reiterates what I just said, that we can't just you know, kill ourselves or just you know, try to reach heaven as quickly as possible. Uh, we're here to serve God. We try to create his kingdom here on earth, and eventually that will pay off. So when we go to heaven, we'll be in the earthly city. Um, so um, St. Augustine, who is a church father, becomes very important in shaping early Christianity. He writes other, other things, and you can read that on your own. I believe you can get City of God for free and some of his other works too. Um, but they, you know, people like him begin to shape Christianity. Another important figure is Jerome. Jerome is able to take these texts that are written in many languages and translate it into Latin. Basically, he takes the Bible, and if you ever read the Bible, you know that it's, it's like we said earlier, it's a hodgepodge of different um, sources written in many different languages. And um, he's able to synthesize it and translate it into one common language. And this is important as we move forward because Latin becomes the language of the church. Um, now, they are borrowed from the Romans, but it does become this common language that people use uh, within this particular institution. So again, he's another important church father. Now, when it comes to church, uh, the church wasn't created with a pope on, you know, at the, at the center of his faith. Um, during this period, you know, the 400s, um, you have a lot of important figures, um, a lot of important cities with bishops in each one of them. And any of them could have claimed this kind of authority over Christianity. So how did Rome become the ultimate authority, particularly for the Catholic Church? Well, <clears throat> In Constantinople, you have a bishop of Constantinople, and you also have the emperor there. And typically, the emperor supersedes any other authority, right? Because he is the emperor, and bishops just do whatever the emperor tells them to do. Uh, Alexandria is another important city. Um, I know there's one more I can't remember, <clears throat> but you know there's there's a few of them, and they all have bishops. Now, with the Roman Empire moving to the east. Um, part of it, you have the city of Rome basically empty, right, with really no key authority. Now, there are times with, where the Roman Empire, Emperor still kind of controls it, but for the most part, they're left on their own. And um, somebody needs to take in that kind of power vacuum, and it, it's the popes who, who argue that they're the ones who lead the city, even though they're supposed to be spiritual. Back then, there's really no difference between a spiritual entity and a the governing entity. <clears throat> so it's Pope Leo I who implements this idea that the church, uh, sorry, that this, uh, the Bishop of Rome is the ultimate authority of this new Christian faith. And he does this by using what's called the Patrine Supremacy. He argued, um, if you know this from history, you know, Peter, St. Peter and Paul both actually end up dying in Rome, right? So, um, since Peter was the first bishop of Rome, and since Jesus designated him as his representative here on earth, whoever takes his position, therefore, will be the leader of this new Christian faith. So whoever takes the position of bishop of Rome essentially controls um, this, this, um, this new faith. Now, this is the way to kind of justify it. However, understand that there's nobody in Rome to kind of rule anything, right? Rome is basically on its own. So this is part of a power vacuum that they use this Patrine supremacy to justify being the leaders of this city and also of this faith. Like, again, this is very kind of general, but this essentially is how things kind of happen, how the Catholic Church begins to kind of dominate this faith. Now, another issue that we see within the Catholic Church is the role of women. Early on during the, the origins of Christianity, we see women take a very prominent role within, you know, the church. 
Many of them were um, leaders within. You know, many of them were martyrs. Uh, many of them died for this faith, right? Many of them taught this faith. So, you know, uh, some of them were priests. So what happened? Why did they um, all of a sudden take a very secondary role within this faith? Well, a lot of it has to do with the way patriarchy um, was replicated within the Catholic Church. So what we see happening is that the Catholic Church takes uh, takes or borrows a lot from the Roman Empire. Even things like basilicas, they borrow that kind of church structure from the Romans. Um, so the, the Catholic Church does a lot of plagiarizing, if you will. And one of them is the way they view women. And since there is a lot of patriarchy within the Catholic Church, or sorry, within Roman culture, and these people are still essentially Roman, they kind of borrow some of those ideas as to why women are viewed as second-class citizens. One of these uh, things that they begin to practice is this concept called asceticism. And, and you might know this, if, again, if you're Catholic, that you're, you know, there's certain times of the year where you're supposed to you know, renounce certain things. Uh, a lot of times it's like meat on Fridays and things like that, right? Um, but we see this in other ways in the Catholic Church, particularly among the monks, where they begin to renunciate certain things, particularly the will of an individual, right? Um, so one of them is, you know, food, but another part is also sex. And during this period, it is a very kind of patriarchal culture where women are actually blamed for tempting men, right? Uh, so they want to keep their souls clean, but they feel that there, there's certain... Um, there are certain um, temptress in society, whether it be women or food or whatever it may be, that corrupt them. So one of them is women. So they're kind of blaming women for tempting them to engage in, in sex. So women kind of get the blame. And this is part of, again, that Roman culture that women should not be um, leaders. And it's just by many ways. Part of it has to do with the whole Adam and Eve story. Women are seen as corrupting men, right? Um, Eve gave the apple to Adam, therefore corrupting him. So women kind of begin to be chastised early on in this new Christian faith, whereas before it becomes this dominant entity, um, women have very prominent roles, right? You know, they, again, they were priests and, and led church um, readings and things like that. So <clears throat> now... Um, when women were seen as something negative, you know, something that um, corrupted society. Uh, I'm going to stop it there and then continue this in another lecture, right? Continue this conversation.